Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for joining us today for this tax planning webinar. We're going to go ahead and get started in just a few moments. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the webinar series with Cornerstone Wealth, where our wealth advisors provide insight to financial planning topics to benefit our, benefit our current and future clients. My name is Charles Robinson. I'm a wealth advisor here at Cornerstone with a master's in financial planning. I have my colleague, Alex Barnes, here with us as well. And today's topic is taxes. It's about what you keep. And we brought in a special guest today, CPA, Jordan Crant with Adeptus CPAs. Jordan, how are you? Good. How are you doing, Charlie? We're doing great. Doing great. Appreciate you taking the time to help us out. Um, we're definitely going to lean on your expertise throughout this presentation. No, of course, I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Absolutely. As an independent RRA, providing comprehensive wealth management services for individuals, families, and businesses, taxes play an important role in our overall advisory process. Throughout our conversation today, we will discuss the impact taxes have on three specific segments of our client base. Alex, do you mind walking us through those three different uh, sections of our client base? Yeah, and thanks, Charlie. And thank you, everybody, for listening in today to all of our clients, their guests, anybody that's on the phone call. Uh, really, we, we wanted to take this time to talk about three different areas or three different segments as we're talking through today. So we have our accumulators. So those who are individuals that are working, saving money towards financial independence, retirement, or any future goal that we're looking forward to. And accumulators can be W-2, it can be 1099, really anybody in that early stage that's, as we say, accumulating. Then we kind of move on as we get older in life. Maybe we've accumulated some assets at this point. So now we kind of fall into the higher net worth. Or if you're a business owner, which Cornerstone Wealth Group has a, a great business owner segment that we work with, both Charlie and a bunch of other advisors within our firm. So you could be a business owner. So individuals who own a business, high net worth, if you are executive within a business, if you just have done a fantastic job of saving and preparing for the future, and now we're looking to kind of make sure that we are really fine detailing our retirement planning, our goal setting, and obviously taxes are a big part of that. And then lastly, retirees. So as we approach financial independence and retirees and those who are already financially independent, of course, the, the tax burden never stops. So managing that, preparing for it, you do that through the first two phases. And then now as a retiree, we still want to be cognizant of what taxes we're paying and how we're managing our assets. So that way we're mindful of that along the way. So Charlie, now that we go ahead and, and kind of get started with the accumulators and tell us a little bit about what we'll be going over today. Yeah, and accumulators, that's, that's where it all starts, right? So fresh out of school or that first job, you know, you're not really thinking about taxes too much. You're just happy that you're, you're getting paid for the work that you're doing. And unfortunately, you know, that's, that's one of the biggest misses early on in people's, you know, investments or tax kind of experience careers, if you will. Um, but what we find so often in working with individuals in the space is that they're so excited that they're earning a paycheck and then they get the, the excitement of filing their taxes and actually getting money back. And they're just like, man, I just want to work with my CPA. My CPA got me this much back or my CPA did this and got me even more back. And really what we want to do is we want to make sure that we're matching up our withholdings to our tax liability. And it's always best to receive that money throughout the year. So instead of getting three, four, five, or even in some cases, you know, eight or $9,000 back at the end of the year, you could actually get a little bit of that money in every single paycheck and apply it to goals or needs that you have and not be accumulating debt or borrowing from other places in order to get you through until you receive that tax refund. And Jordan, as a CPA, I know this is a topic that always comes up. People coming in your office February, March, and April and saying, hey, you know, looking for that money back, we're so excited. Tell us what your experiences are with people in, in, in regards to withholdings and, and tax liability. Thanks, Charlie. So, I mean, one of the most common misconceptions um, 
that, ma- that many clients basically have when they come into us is that big refunds mean great year. And that's usually not really the case. Big refunds mean you let the IRS or the state hold on to your money all year, interest free, only to get it back in a lump sum at the end of the year. Um, if you visit vice versa and you owe the IRS and the states the same thing, the same amount of time, they don't reciprocate the same kindness. So the optimal goal is to really maximize your cash inflow throughout the year. The object of the tax return is really to get to as close of a break even point as possible. That way, you can start saving more money throughout the year, make those goals with your financial planner. That's why it's important to have both a good CPA and a good financial planner. That way you're not really over withholding and unnecessarily allowing the government to hold on to your money all year. So we basically look at the return, try to adjust the withholdings appropriately and get them on the right track. Got it, got it, thank you. And, and, you know, really appreciate you kind of walking through that. And I know, you know, one of the things that unfortunately has been happening quite often, more frequent than a lot of us would like with the current conditions is so many people are losing their jobs or being furloughed or any other of the different situations going on because of COVID-19. So we wanted to take a little bit of time and just walk through how some of the benefits that individuals have been receiving over these last couple of months are taxed. And so, you know, you have your unemployment that's provided by the state and that's taxed at the federal level, but not at the state level. You have severance packages that some people may receive because either their their work, their their employer is kind of shrinking their workforce and asking people to walk away or retire early and getting lump sums or payouts over months. Um, and, and even you have the stimulus check, the COVID-19 relief check, which is something that many people have benefited from. And that's, that's untaxable. But Jordan, as we, as we look at the primarily the unemployment and the severance, how, do, how should people plan or how do they figure out what they should withhold and things along those lines when they receive those benefits? So another great question, Charlie. So severance is basically the same as W-2s. Anyone who receives a severance, you're basically gonna receive a W-2, even if you didn't work for them at all in that year. So you get laid off at the end of one year, the severance is really getting paid the next year, you will get a W-2. So it has to be planned accordingly to make sure that that income is really being planned for and the overall scope of your return. Same thing, same thing with unemployment. Even though it's not taxable to the state, it is taxable on the federal return. And same thing, there's obviously other sources of income coming from different various um, vehicles, but all of that really has to go into account on the same type of level. So we want to make sure and we inform and educate all of our clients to make sure that they give us all the information. If they're going to get a severance, we should know. Otherwise, come tax time, you might be really over withheld or you might be really under withheld. Both scenarios, not good. So we really stress to make sure we know all the facts, how we can plan accordingly. Gotcha. Gotcha. And, and, you know, one of the things that happened, Alex, is that, you know, there's these different programs that have you know, impacted individuals directly. But obviously there's some things that have been put in place from the benefit side of things that are more on the employer side, but do have a little bit of an effect on the employee. Would you mind taking some time and kind of walking us through a little bit of the paycheck, you know, protection program and how that works from an employee's perspective? Yeah, and I think that's a a great segue from talking about unemployment benefits and Jordan touching on really how they're still taxable and even when we talk about unemployment benefits and how they're taxable, let's say you're not receiving unemployment benefits. So let's say you work for a smaller mid-sized business that is able to fall within the guidelines of qualifying for the Paycheck Protection Program and the loan. So we'll talk about this more specifically as it applies to employers, but you know, for employees, just so you understand, and if you're on this call and you're an employee or if you're listening and employee of one of these businesses, the Paycheck Protection Program really is intended to help the employer help you because obviously the employer needs to be in business for you to continue your job, continue your wages. So quick overview, the Paycheck Protection Program is a program designed to provide direct incentive for small businesses to keep their workers on payroll. And then additionally, the employer is able to receive loan forgiveness and not pay the loan back, assuming conditions are met, such as keeping their employees on payroll or if they do, do have to furlough them or fire anybody if they're brought back within a certain amount of time. Uh, 
in this act, there's a lot of changes. It, it's extremely fluid. The first iteration of this went through, and even recently, there's been changes that, you know, even with the information we have on the screen that have even been updated since then. So one of the key things here is that loan proceeds, the majority of them have to be spent on payroll costs. So clearly the, you know, the government, when they came up with this program, the intention here is to keep, you know, the American people employed, especially within those small and mid-sized businesses. So Previously, it was 75% of loan proceeds that had to be used for payroll costs. It's actually been lowered down to 60%. And then the other 40% can be used for really uh, the main things that an employer needs to keep track of. So obviously their rent, utilities, mortgages, if they own the building, things of that nature. Now that 60% and 40%, really the one that we need to know more about is the 60 for the employee because while that is a baseline that has to be met for the loan forgiveness, the 60% can, you know, an employer can go above that. So they could still spend the 75%. They could spend, you know, really more of that if they wanted to on employees or as far as their payroll go. But, you know, Jordan, really, I want to bring you in here, you know, simply because you're the you know, subject matter expert and I'm sure you know more about the PPP and the payroll protection program as it's, you know, as it's known. So why don't you tell us a little bit more specifically details that employees maybe should understand either for themselves or from an employer standpoint. No, of course, Alex, thank you. And the biggest challenge with the employees and a lot of you know scenarios, depending on which state you happen to live in, is can I collect unemployment even though I'm getting this PPP check when my state's telling me I can't go to work, I gotta stay home, my business isn't even open, yet I still have to get this PPP check, which potentially could disqualify me for unemployment, yet unemployment pays better than my job. So part of that has been an ongoing argument. And as Alex, you were saying before, this PPP loan protection program, the SBA has changed so many things so many times. It's an ever-changing thing. And what they've done recently is kind of help the employer and the employee at the same time by not requiring the employer to meet that 75% threshold, now 60%. And instead of paying this back over eight weeks, it is now 24 weeks, therefore allowing the employee to collect unemployment when they actually can't physically get back to work. And that'll allow the employer to have the rest of the year really from the point that they get the money, the 24 week period, to cut those PPP loan paychecks that way they satisfy the requirement to get the loan forgiven so really they did a good job by changing all these uh, these specific stipulations in the program um, there's probably still more to come but uh, that definitely helps the employee and the employer for that standpoint alone yeah no that's great and you know honestly I'm glad you brought that up it really ties into you know Charlie what he was saying earlier and, and you as well Jordan talking about your withholdings because as you maybe start collecting benefits and at the same time potentially getting paid from an employer who's benefiting from the PPP, making sure your withholdings are in line and evaluating. I, mean, it, I tell my clients the same thing that as you go through the year, you know, if it's quarterly, semi-annually, take a look at your, your payroll, take a look at your withholdings and, you know, roughly figure out if you're kind of on track and if changes need to be made. Sure. So thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Good information, Jordan. And I think well, that's a that's a good you know transition to our next you know segment that we're focused on, which is high net worth and business owners. And really, what we want to kind of you know express here and, and, and define these two segments a little more clearly is these are individuals that have gone through that kind of initial accumulating stage, still in working years and their highest working years potentially, and have accumulated assets, whether it's traditional assets as far as investments and stocks, or maybe it's they've invested in themselves and build a business. And so they're continuing to generate revenue and income for themselves from a W-2 standpoint. But now they also have this bucket of money or assets that's also kicking off income, positioning them to eventually make the transition of financial independence in the future years to come. And one of the things that we find most challenging is that we've always heard clients talk about diversification, asset allocation, how important is it? What does it mean? And so we talk to them about stocks and growth oriented stocks, you know, dividend paying stocks, bonds, you know, corporate bonds, municipal bonds, so on and so forth. And then even real estate and all these other alternatives and gold and so on and so forth and making sure that we have the right mix of those investments to give them the balanced portfolio that we need. 
One thing that often gets missed from advisors and just the investor in, in general is where do I hold these type of investments? When we're making you know, good money on a W-2 wage scenario, we have this non-qualified or non-tax deferred bucket of money that's kicking out dividends and ordinary income. We could potentially be paying taxes on money that we're not using and creating an unnecessary tax liability for ourselves for income that we really don't need until the future. And so one of the things that we focus on is making sure that we have income oriented investments and the right allocation and the right type of accounts, which would be tax deferred accounts. Think of your 401k or your IRA, whereas the income is generated, it doesn't cost additional tax liability to you. And then also those growth oriented investments such as stocks, we're gonna hold those in the non tax deferred accounts because we can benefit from a lower or a preferred tax rate compared to our ordinary income tax rate. And so Jordan, I know come every April, you're looking at the front sheet of that 1040 and you can see on clients, you know, line items in the beginning, ordinary income, dividend income, so on and so forth. What kind of things are you talking to your clients about when you see really high levels and how that's negatively impacting their tax situation overall? So really what we are focused on are, like you said, the specific types of investment income that have these favorable tax situations. So specifically, you know, qualified dividends and long-term capital gains are the types of investment income that these non-tax deferred accounts should be focused on because those have the preferable treatments, uh, 15% rates. So obviously, if you're in the highest tax bracket, you then have 23.9%, but still the highest ordinary rate is 37%, much better at 23.9, even if you're in the highest bracket. So it's just making sure that they understand that don't sell anything within a year. If it has a big gain, let it ride. At least just get over that 12 month period, get that long-term favorable rate. Same thing with qualified dividends. You know, we try to stress that obviously interest is great. I know a lot of clients have interest income. Um, if you had in-state tax exempt interest, even better, but interest income alone is taxed at the ordinary rates. So if you're in that highest bracket, and you're making wages, you know, like 400 to 500,000 plus. Um, obviously, your W-2 income, ordinary income. But if you got an extra, you know, five or 10 grand on interest, you know, by having that in a non-tax deferred account, you're then paying 37% on that interest. So right. it, it's really, you know, really coordinating with the financial planner and the client at the same time to make sure we're really getting capturing the right buckets for what types of income should be reported on the return. Yeah, and that's a good point. And, 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 you know, talking about where to hold these, you know, investments in the different accounts and, and how they're taxed. And Alex, I know, you know, you do a, a good amount of work from a planning, you know, process and making sure that clients understand what those different tax deferred non tax accounts are. Um, do you mind running through this real quick and just sharing with us some of the accounts that would fall in these different categories of before tax, after tax taxable and after tax tax free? Yeah, so, um, in terms of when we talk to clients or our clients that are on this call, you've probably seen this tax pit triangle, uh, you know, as it's kind of simply put. And as we all know, when whenever money is made, the majority of that those earnings or if it's in an IRA or a 401k, when it comes out of that shell and that shelter, that tax pit has to gobble up some of it. Um, and that's why we talk about, you know, that's why we're talking about taxes today. As you're an accumulator, as you're a uh, retiree, if you're anywhere in between, you have to worry or be conscious of this tax pit. And one thing we, we're not gonna talk about today is the tax brackets, but Jordan referenced it. I think Charlie, you've referenced it now too. Those tax brackets ultimately are gonna help you decide in terms of what you have available to you, if it's IRAs, 401ks, or if it's just after tax investments, how you should position your assets and then where they're gonna be taxable. So going through this, we can see at the bottom of the pyramid, and really, the reason it's kind of at the bottom, it, you know, it takes up the majority of that line item because when you think of on the left-hand side, your SEP IRA, your simple IRA, your pre-tax 401k and traditional IRA, that is, it, you know, the majority of those aside from traditional IRA is going to be employer-sponsored plans, traditional IRA being the pre-tax where when you file your tax return with Jordan or anybody else, you're getting that tax deduction, that line item. So, now you're taking your total income, you're reducing it by the contribution that you made. After tax investment account, but still taxable. So now we're talking about the gains. So as Jordan talked about, short-term gains, long-term gains, qualified dividends, ordinary dividends, interest income. So if you have cash at the bank and 
you know, even if it's only that half a percent annual yield, it's still a taxable dividend or a taxable interest as it accumulates even at the bank. So those are the things you, you always have to be aware of. And then as we move up to the top of the triangle, we look at tax-free money. So Roth 401k, Roth IRA, another one on here that really is important and, and even more so now is an HSA or a health savings account. And then you could even put in cash value life insurance. So these are ways that you can potentially shelter away from some of those taxes and avoid them. Not because you're doing anything illegal, of course, you know, anything we talk about today is going to be within the confines or what the IRS allows us to do. And the Roth IRA, Roth 401k with the tax system that we're in right now is a great situation that you could find yourself in. Now, of course, evaluating where you fall from a bracket standpoint is going to be important because as you move higher up that, that you know, tax bracket, those IRAs down at the bottom could provide you a better tax benefit in today's dollars than they do as a future value. So it's important when we talk about taxes, we are always considering future value versus present value as it relates to the account and when you're paying the tax in a given year. We're, again, we'll talk about this a little bit later on, but if you make a deduction in a current year and at a higher bracket, so if you're high net worth or if you're higher income and you're making a, a bracket or a deduction in a higher bracket, it could be more valuable than somebody who's at a lower income and now they're making Roth contributions because now instead of paying tax at a higher bracket, they're paying at a lower bracket and then taking advantage potentially of 10, 30 years of growth at that point. So this triangle, pretty simplified as far as, you know, looking at it right now, but the way that you position and the way you transition money in and out of these, it's, it's really from a planning perspective. Uh, it, it's exciting to me and I'm sure it is to Charlie and Jordan as well, but this is, this is really a pretty, uh, strong picture of how you can see positioning money is important. Yeah, listen, you know, I, I, you know, as I look at it and hear you talk about it, and Jordan, I'm sure you can chime in on this, but obviously the, the name of the game is to see you get as much money at the top of this triangle as you can. It's not as easy as just moving money from the SEP or simple of 401k or your investment accounts up to that after tax, tax-free uh, situation. But I think really, you know, one key takeaway that I would say for, for any of these sections is if you have the ability, and unfortunately it's not on this slide, but if you have the ability to put money in an HSA where you can get a deduction as well as use that money tax-free, that is probably the, you know, the most impactful opportunity that clients have, um, from, from my opinion, uh, to, to really leverage the current system. And Jordan, would you, would you have any additional insight on that or thoughts? I mean, like you, were, like you and Alex were both saying, it's really about looking at the, well, it's, it's timing. So these, these pre-tax contributions, the HSA, the 401k, traditional IRA, when it's common, commonly known, usually commonly known, while we're working, we're going to be in our, higher, our highest brackets. So it, we want to get those savings on these higher rates now. That way we can better plan with our investment in, in, in the future. And these Roths are a great tool, great vehicle, because they're after-tax money. Um, and they, they are very strict as far as who can and cannot contribute directly to a Roth. Um, if, you, if you're married, file, and joint, and you're over, I think it's like 190, you are phased out entirely, your AGI. But um, there's something called a backdoor Roth, where you could basically contribute to additional IRA and still convert it to a Roth, have no tax, and, and then appreciate that free growth. Uh, in the future years. So it's just making sure that you take advantage of what you can at the time. Um, that way you're putting as most money away as possible while you're allowed to, like I was saying, nothing's illegal here. You can do all this. You can max out your HSA. You can max out your 401k. Um, and you could still contribute to a Roth IRA through that back door. It's just about getting the right information and uh, taking advantage of it. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and the key is the information and education. And hopefully that's what, you know, clients and potential clients that are listening, you know, take away from this. And, you know, we talked about earlier how the PPP or the Paycheck Protection Program was impacting employees. Um, but obviously there's some nuances, some of which we touched upon, some of which we didn't. But real quickly, you know, as we, you know, go through this, but Alex, can you speak about some of the really detailed things that would impact the business owner? as he positions himself with the, uh, or herself with the PPP loan? Yeah, so again, we talked about this earlier from an employee perspective and we focused on, you know, obviously 
payroll as being the main portion of the PPP, helping keep the employer to be able to pay the employee and keep them you know, surviving through all this in unprecedented times. So now let's look at, again, some of the, some of the details, if you're a business owner on this call, some of the things you want to know about. So one of the big things here, and again, this information changes so quickly that even the information we have today, we really need to go back and, and make some tweaks to, but current forgiveness on those expenses. So we talked about, you know, for the employer or paying the employee with that loan to be forgivable, the forgiveness period right now. So they had eight weeks. It's now been extended. It's up to 24 weeks for that current forgiveness period. And then the loan payment. So let's say, for example, if an employer isn't going to meet the requirements for forgivable, obviously they still have potentially a very beneficial loan with some great terms that are available for them. So now loan payments can be deferred for six months on this PPP loan as well. So again, taking them through the hardest part of the year right now is you know, businesses continue to stay shut down. As we go through these phased openings, they're able to defer those payments, potentially getting them closer to the end of the year and allowing them to hopefully ramp their workforce back up, get back to a normal situation. Then the next thing being the loan maturity. So again, as a business owner, or even if you're an individual, of course, whenever you evaluate a loan or a lending product of any kind, when does it have to be paid back within? So loan maturity actually, again, this is one of those small changes that it was extended up to five years for the loan maturity and the interest rate is 1%. So again, from a beneficial standpoint to the employer, having a 1% a loan, I mean, we talk about mortgage rates being historically low and floating around two to 3%. I mean, th these employers are getting a loan at 1% interest rate. So they're getting a great tool for them to stay in business. So, you know, Jordan, I'm sure, again, there's probably more details and, you know, we could spend a, a whole webinar just on the PPP and the changes that take place you know, on a consistent basis. But what else can you add that an employer could take away from this specifically? So really what, what changes were made to the PPP has, they really were looking after the employer. Um, and it's also the employee too, but like you touched on about deferring the loan payments, giving them more time to pay out these funds and giving them a longer time to pay them back at the same low interest rate. Um, and so in addition to this, there's also additional stipulations on, um, uh, or guidelines on what to do if your employee count does not stay the same. Um, there are exceptions. You don't have to have the same employees anymore. Um, basically, if you're attempting to get the employees to come back and they're refusing, they will still allow you to get forgiveness and not have to decrease by any amount. Um, payroll taxes. So with obviously any kind of payroll return and any kind of paycheck, you have the employee withholdings and there's also the employer responsibility, Social Security, Medicare. They've allowed now you to defer those employer payroll taxes for six months as well. So. There's additional information and additional guidelines that are coming out to allow these employers to stay in business. That way they're not rushing to pay everything back, which is what the original program was suited for. So now we have 24 weeks to pay it back, six months to start loan payments, and six months to actually pay the payroll tax associated with it. So um, I think they did a good job, but as we've been saying, this is an ever-changing thing it might evolve again. We'll just keep our, we'll keep our heads, our eyes open and our, our ears open. Gotcha. Gotcha. And, and Jordan, real quick, while you're, while you're there and you're talking, just, you know, we're going to jump into another area and I know so much has changed. Some of what we touched upon, but you know, we go back a couple of years and obviously the tax brackets and tax rates and all those things change. One of which was standard deductions really quickly before we jump into this next thing about impactful tax events. Do you mind just, you know, telling us what the, the current tax, you know, uh, standard deductions are and, and what that, how that environment's changed over the years? All right. So when, yeah, when Trump came into office, he basically restructured the entire code. Um, he got rid of a lot of deductions on the item on schedule and, but really increased the standard deductions. So, I mean, on your 2018 return, it was 24,000. And obviously these things go up each year by small amounts. 19 was 24,4. It'll likely be 24, eight or close to 25,000 in 2020. So, you know, what that does is, and, it's, and with the tax, the real estate tax and uh, state and local taxes being capped, it really kind of limits what kind of deductions you could take. So 
It's really limiting to mortgage interest, which also is now limited further, and uh, donations, and because medical expenses are really hard to see in general. But knowing how to take advantage of these deductions now is more important than ever, and it's really contributing to charity, but you know, in a different way, not just straight cash, but this next slide will basically touch on some things where you can uh, make some donations that will really help your tax situation going forward. Yeah, absolutely. And listen, I want to be really clear about, you know, the, you know, our webinar and what we're doing, obviously having a CPA on here as well as ourselves who've gone through, you know, rigorous training to understand these different areas. Um, by no means are we talking about tax avoidance or tax, you know, tax evasion. This is just a, you know, maximize really the money in your pocket based on the current rules and things that are in place. So we just want to be really clear about that. And as we continue forward, some of the big events that happen to high net worth individuals, as well as business owners is, you know, selling their business, liquidating appreciated assets, exercising restricted stocks. And these are all things as they get themselves prepared to kind of take that next transition, be financially independent. And some of the things that we do to kind of minimize their tax liability in these different transitional periods is to uh, utilize different vehicles that are out there, some of which um, you know, I've used, some of which Alex has used, and I'm sure, Jordan, you've seen a combination of all. But I'm just gonna take you know, one quick example of a charitable remainder trust that we use with the business owner. He sold his business in 2019, um, had a very low basis, meaning that you know, the money that he had in it was not nearly uh, where uh, it sold for, and so there was a lot of gains there. We were able to shift a certain amount of that money to a charitable remainder trust, you know, basically as a donation and where he could benefit and his family could benefit from the interest generated from it, but he was able to get an immediate deduction for the amount that he put in there, saving in his case, tens if not hundreds of thousands of dollars as soon as that was done. And, and Alex, I know you've, you know, done some work around gifting appreciated stocks and donor advised funds. Um, do you have an example of what impact that can have for an individual that might be listening on the call today? Yeah, I think even uh, as much as donor advised funds uh, and gifting appreciated stock is important, understanding, like we say, those impactful tax events and selling the business, liquidating assets, you know, big example here of gifting appreciated stock. It's a very simple one, even somebody who's, you know, maybe not in the highest tax bracket. So if you're charitably inclined, gifting appreciated stock that has low basis is a great way to move that asset without having to take on the tax liability, you know, for yourself. So donor advised funds, you know, of course, there's always going to be points where from a gifting standpoint, maybe it makes sense to go into a donor advised fund. If you have some type of windfall, if you're selling a business, you know, liquidating assets, if you're exercising some stock positions, there's a number of reasons and really the limits that you can, you know, put within these. And that's, again, we don't want to necessarily get into those fine details today. Having a detailed conversation with a CPA, with an advisor, that's where it becomes important, understanding your individual situation. But again, using, using selling a business as a great example, uh, I've had a few clients that have gone through this process of selling a business. And, you know, the main thing I'll say, it's very impactful, obviously, from a tax event standpoint. It's typically, you know, especially if you're a business owner, it's your largest asset by nature. It's, you're going to put your whole life into that. You want to make sure, again, that you're not giving away too much from a tax liability standpoint. So putting yourself in position five, 10 years in advance of selling a business and thinking about exit strategies, even with restricted stock, thinking about strategies to exercise positions while potentially you know, capturing some losses in a given year, or again, from a charitable contribution within a given year, these are ways that you really need to start thinking about, especially if you are somebody in this call who maybe is moving from accumulator into this position. If you're a business owner that's you know, on the early part of their career, as you transition to a later point, these are things you really want to start thinking about ahead of time, not the year in which you go, I'm going to sell this business, now I'm going to start planning for it. Just like retirement, it needs to be started sooner than the year that you're doing it. Absolutely, absolutely. Jordan, I don't know if you had any, any thoughts or input around these things, but we'd you know, love to hear from you if you do. No, of course. I mean, one of the also part of selling a business is really to see if you qualify for the uh, Qualify Small Business Stock um, exemption. You know, and like Charlie was alluding to before, when you know, you're a domestic corporation, if you are C-Corp, and you have very low basis, 
and you sell this company for really you know, millions of dollars potentially, um, you could have at least half of that, potentially 100% of it, basically wiped clean. So it's really just, and that's planning for, you know, like, like Alex was saying, all, the, all these things should be done really a year in advance. You really need to be on top of these specific tax events that can help reduce um, your liability. And one other topic I like to just talk about is like, and not just gifting appreciated, st appreciated stock, but also donating appreci appreciated stock. Um, people have big portfolios, you know, they normally do contribute some stock each year as opposed to cash. The reason for this is this year in the highest tax bracket, you know, your, um, your marginal rate is 37%. Um, you get a deduction for donating this at 37% versus paying tax on it at 23.9. So you save that, so you get to reduce your income by 37% versus the other way around. So it's just 16%, 14% you're saving basically on taxes there. So it's really just making sure you take advantage of what you can and making sure you're following the right uh, structure and doing this, like Alex was saying again, in advance. It's just trying to plan it all so quickly, so close to uh, the end of the year, it usually doesn't go very well. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And, and, and we're a big proponent of, of planning, you know, on a regular basis as opposed to, you know, one-offs every couple of years. Things change so fast, especially from a, a tax standpoint, that it's important that you meet with your advisors on a regular basis. But, you know, as we continue and move forward, you know, one of the things, I'm just sitting here listening to us talk and I'm like, Man, we've, we've we started the job. We've we've got our withholdings right. We've been saving all along. We've accumulated a good portfolio. We're managing all that stuff. Finally, I sold my business. Finally, I've made it right. Like I've I've reached the pinnacle which I've been striving for. I'm financially independent, and then I'm so excited. And I meet with my advisors that one last time. And and the topic they bring up again is is taxes. And I'm like, I, I thought I was beyond this, and it's, it seems to never never I can never get away from it. So. Here we are in the stages of financial independence as a retiree, and it, it rears its head again. And, and Alex, you know, I know, you know, um, you spent some time, and, and as a firm, we work a lot with transitioning clients from those working years to recreating a paycheck to support themselves and live the lifestyle that they've always dreamed of. But part of that is, you know, reallocating their portfolios. Walk us through what that looks like and, and how taxes play a role in that. Yeah, so th this is a very powerful slide for retirees or, or people or anybody that is moving from that phase of life into retirement or financial independence. And the real reason is because, again, like you said, Charlie, taxes are still around. Taxes never leave us. I mean, that's, that's the key point here we always want to be clear about. And then when you think about growth portfolios as you're younger, you're, you're typically taking advantage of growth portfolios. So if you're in the accumulator phase, if you're in the high net worth or business owner, typically 10, 20, 30 years even still, you're looking at growth, maybe not necessarily the defensive position. And these are conversations we're having constantly with our clients as, as they move into retirement. Of course, naturally, people want to take defense. They, you know, they want to move defensive because... Now, instead of trying to grow these assets and having my paycheck to be my back, my support behind me, I'm creating my paycheck. So when we think about moving from growth to income portfolios, though, we do want to be aware, like we talked before, if you have dividends, if you have uh, ordinary income that's going to be impacted now by your tax rate, IRA distributions, Social Security, pensions, any, any number of things that could be included into ordinary income, you really, again, have to kind of group all those things together and figure it out. So one of the things here, again, AGI, so adjusted gross income, I think Jordan touched on it a moment ago, but you know, to highlight it even more, when you get into retirement, now all of a sudden we have ordinary income. It doesn't necessarily just impact our taxes. It's going to impact the taxability of our Social Security. So there's, there's levels at which Social Security is taxable and the amount that's included. Uh, and then with your Medicare premium. So again, if you have high distributions from taxable accounts, the amount that you pay for your insurance could potentially get higher. So that's, you know, right there, that's a hot topic issue. Everybody's always talking about medical expenses as they get into retirement years or as everybody ages and, you know, the medical story really just doesn't go the way that really impacts it. So taking advantage of growth assets and in in appropriate portfolios while still being aware of, again, as a retiree, potentially needing defense. So 
if, in my, if I have my Roth IRA or if I have my after-tax account, I'm going to tr maybe try and position a little bit more of my growth assets in there, depending on you know, my ability to handle that. Then inside of my IRA, as Jordan said before, all the money in the IRA is taxed at the same rate. There is no tax preferential treatment for long-term capital gains. So as we accumulate dividends, if we have dividend paying stocks, we potentially want to try and you know, shelter those or put them more into that, that IRA shelter because now it doesn't matter growth versus income. It's, it's all taxed the same when it comes out, no matter what. Uh, so, so Jordan, I mean, if there's anything here, again, from a CPA's perspective that you can basically add to, we would love to hear that as well. No, of course. So, I mean, to go back a few slides, basically, it's really stressing um, growth and how long you can grow it. That's why in your earlier years, you should try to be maxing out all these different retirement vehicles, especially the 401k and especially the IRA. And if you have the ability and knowledge and uh, a good CPA, of course, um, you can utilize this backdoor Roth uh, IRA conversion where you don't get any tax on the actual conversion and you let that money grow and you take it out at the, uh, obviously when you retire, because um, that basically focuses on the taxability of Social Security, like you were saying, Alex, where if you can get your overall AGI below a certain level, Social Security might not be taxed at 85%, which is the highest amount, might be taxed at 50%, maybe 0%. So when, you take out, when you're taking out from the Roth IRA, so, because that's not taxable at all. So it's really planning really for the whole entire duration of really your, I guess, work career starting from as an accumulator, ending as a retiree, to make sure that you're really having the right maximization of your retirement funds. That way you're set up for when you actually retire. Yeah, Jordan, that's great. And you know, to hear you say, again, working with a great CPA like yourself and others, I know, you know we, every, every client has their CPA, hopefully, that is doing a great job for them. And if not, Jordan, you know, please, we want definitely to, to have you help them as well. But it's great to see you say it, and I, I kind of tell my clients this as a financial planner, myself and Charlie, sometimes we may give a recommendation that is a tax burden because we're thinking of the future value versus the present value of a decision that's being made. So for you, Jordan, to hear you say, you know, sometimes when you talk about the backdoor Roth, you may have a client that is looking at this going, well, that doesn't give me the tax deduction. Why would I do something like that? It's great to hear you explaining that because ultimately myself, Charlie, everybody within our firm and, and your firm too, it sounds like is giving an explanation as to why you make a decision, not just giving a blanket, re, you know, blanket statement. Yeah, no, good point, Alex. And, and, you know, you know, as we continue on, I know we could talk about this stuff all day. We're approaching 43 minutes and I'm like, man, I could talk about this and that and the other. There's so much information. And again, it just changes. And you know what, what kind of pops in my mind is that, so often, Jordan, clients come to us and they say, listen, I just want to make money. I got a million dollars. I want to invest it with you. I'm looking for a 10, 15, 20% return. Make that happen for me. And that's something that, you know, we're always challenged. And I, you know, you know, the title of the, the whole webinar is taxes. It's about what you keep. There's that old adage, it's not what you make, it's about what you keep. And it's, it's so important when you think about getting a 10% return on a million dollars and a hundred thousand, but then is that taxed at 37%? Is that taxed at 15%? Zero? You know, what, what are you really looking at and how does that impact? And it has such a bearing long term and why it's so important. And as we kind of continue to kind of move forward and, and bring things to a close, you know, one of the biggest things that's happening right now in, in our country is that we're going through the, you know, one of the most challenging times that we've probably seen in the country's history or in a really long time. And so we hear that word unprecedented, unprecedented, unprecedented. And, and so many things are. And one of the things are that, you know, we have very low interest rates. We have, you know, some, some, some tax rates that historically speaking are probably pretty low. And so what we want to look at and say is like to our clients listening and to our, our hopefully our future clients listening, that, you know, there's so much money being pumped into the system right now. And the way that we're structured as a country is we, as earners in this country, and people that pay taxes are gonna be responsible for that bill. And so Alex, as, as we go through this and we look at planning for the future, and you talked about maybe taking you know, a hit now because we are at a lower rate or potentially a lower rate than we may be in the future. What kind of things do you look at from a planning perspective to help our clients position themselves, not only today from a tax standpoint, but also 
15, 20, and 30 years down the line. Yeah, that's a, that's a really important thing right now. Uh, you know, first off, like we said, we're historically from a tax rate standpoint, we're very low. Uh, again, I know Jordan can easily you know put out more numbers than I can, but I've done the math more than a few times that. So if we essentially fill up those first few buckets, if you're a married couple, it's about 15 to 17 percent effective tax rate. And that's an important thing to understand, effective tax rate versus the tax bracket and the highest rate which your money could fall into. But ultimately, knowing those things and then thinking about where we potentially could be. First off, we know that these tax rates are going to sunset 2026. We know that you know, potentially there could be a change at any point between now and then, as well as in the future. So like Charlie said, as the people paying the bill, the United States government is not a for-profit business. Now, you know, we're not here to talk about you know, how they collect taxes at which rate they will collect them, but we do know that they have to collect them to pay you know, these liabilities. And if we think about down the road and we think about, well, how do I generate more revenue to pay these bills? It's by you know, obviously taxing more, or creating more tax revenue. So if I'm somebody who's thinking about what can I do to plan for 10, 20, 30 years from now, you can think about, again, taking some IRA distributions if you are able to, <coughs> excuse me, and go ahead and doing those withdrawals in earlier years and then transitioning them or moving them into after tax or potentially converting them into Roth accounts letting them grow now tax-free or potentially with some tax preferential treatment. If you're younger, think about making those Roth contributions. So again, depending on where you fall from an income standpoint, let's think about if I filled up some buckets of after-tax money to get the deduction, instead of getting more of a deduction, maybe we think about, well, I'm at a comfortable place. Maybe I start accumulating some after-tax and some Roth tax-free money. And the HSA, I mean, I don't think we've touched on it enough. Charlie, you talked about it, but that HSA, which could be triple tax free. So get a deduction, use it for medical expenses and retirement and have it be tax free. That's a great extra tool in somebody's planning tool bag that really could help somebody in the future. So Charlie and Jordan, if there's you know, anything else you want to add on to here for our retirees, our business owners, our accumulators, you know, please go ahead and share it with us now. No, you know, I think you did a good job and I'll, I'll kind of lead that to, to Jordan. You know, if, if, if as we wrap up and, and we talk about all these different things, um, you know, just to just to kind of leave, there was one thing that you wanted to uh, an individual listening today to leave with from a tax perspective. What would that be? So the one thing that I would basically tell any individual is tax planning is extremely important, not only with your CPA, but with your financial planner. Um, and just generally speaking, as Alex was alluding to before, the government is has been printing billions of dollars uh, the last couple of months because of what's going on. And we will be responsible for paying back this debt. Um, not, and we're not sure when, because uh, nothing's been decided yet, but it's really making sure that you're planning properly. And can't stress that enough. If you don't tax plan properly, you will get bit in the end. And Alex, is there anything that you feel is a, you know, a takeaway that you would want people to hear um, as we wrap up? Yeah, I think the, uh, the important thing here is, you know, cash flow is king. So when we talk about taxes, really, it all circles back to one important thing, and that's cash flow. So, you know, for clients and anybody listening onto this call or anybody that sees this later on, we're really here to maximize how much you're keeping in your pocket, uh, both today and in the future. So I think, you know, as Jordan alluded, you know, pl proper planning is important, not again, from the tax planning side, but even from an asset side, transitioning those portfolios, transitioning businesses or other assets and making it efficient. It's important. Yeah. And, 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 and I agree wholeheartedly with what both of you just shared. And, and, and I think the biggest thing, um, and Jordan touched upon it about planning, but you know, taxes and the tax rules and the tax codes are going to constantly change. And I'm a big believer in planning for the certainty of uncertainty, meaning that we don't know what the future is going to hold, but I feel much more confident in the ability for you to navigate that sitting down today with your CPA or your advisor, seeing where you are, what your goals are, and navigating yourself as best as you can from a tax perspective uh, towards your future. 
And so I, I, we can't emphasize enough how important it is to engage, if it's not us, um, make sure that you're taking the time to, to take this information and apply it to your situation to maximize uh, you know, all the hard money that you work for. And so on behalf of Alex, Jordan, and our entire Cornerstone Wealth team and partners, we'd like to thank you for participating in our webinar today. If you missed any part of the webinar um, or earlier ones, you can catch them on demand through our Cornerstone website referenced there on your screen. And uh, our next webinar will be Tuesday, June 23rd at 4 p.m. And Jordan, I wanna thank you and Adeptus for being such great partners of our firm and helping the clients. Alex, appreciate everything you do and, and um, all of our partners, again, do for, for the firm and our clients. And uh, we wish everybody a good evening. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out. Our numbers are there and our contact information. We'll be happy to pass along um, Jordan's contact information as well. Appreciate it. See you later, guys. Have a good night.